we are talking about a prayer uh, throughout the month and on Sunday evenings, and we're talking about prayer through the lens of the acts of prayer. You may have heard that acronym some long, somewhere along the way. Uh, and we ask the question as we do this, how do we pray? It's kind of the same question the, the apostles had for Jesus uh, in how they should pray, and the way we're looking at it is through the acts, which is adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. And tonight we're looking specifically at confession. Now, I mentioned last time that adoration may be one of those places that I kind of fall short in prayer because I, I assume God is unbelievable uh, and amazing and powerful and all of those things. I probably don't say it as much as I should, uh, and I definitely don't say it to him as much as I should. And so we talked some last time about how to kind of uh, make that a little more a part of our prayer life. Uh, this one it can be a struggle for us in a lot of different ways. Uh, we, we tend to talk about confession in, in large terms and not necessarily in small terms, and we know all too well that we probably sin quite a bit. And, and so because of that, there is clearly a need for confession to be a regular part of our prayer, but oftentimes the times when we feel like we need confession is when we've done something really bad uh, and when we've really messed up. So we're going to look at confession through a couple different contexts and then see some Bible examples of uh, how it was handled in Scripture, maybe we'll learn a few things from that tonight. So we'll start where we did last time, uh, in the Lord's Prayer, the version that is in Luke 11, where it says that he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. So he says to forgive us our sins. Now we understand that as we begin our walk with Christ and we confess his name and repent and we're baptized into him, that there is a lot of forgiveness that comes at that point. Uh, and the sins that we had before, uh, we talk a lot about the imagery of them being left in the waters of baptism and buried there, and we come out and we rise uh, new. And I, I don't know about you, for some of you that's a, a pretty recent experience. Uh, for some of you that's something that's been a long time ago. I can still remember the feeling, uh, and maybe you can too. I, I still remember what it was like uh, to get up there, to stand in the water, uh, for someone to be saying these words to me and to be taken back into the water, and I remember feeling as I came up out of the water like I was just clean, just new, ready to take on the world, never wanted to sin again, everything was going to be great from that point forward, and I would imagine probably before the left, I left the building, I had done something. Uh, I had had a thought I shouldn't have had, said something I shouldn't have had, uh, already had in my mind plans of some, something I should do that I shouldn't do, or if not, by the time I've left the building, it probably did not take very long before I found myself back in some of the same patterns that I may have been in before. And you've probably experienced that kind of thing too, where you have some kind of issue that you have tried to overcome, tried to do better with, and you find yourself just drawn back into it. So here in the prayer, we have an acknowledgement that these are clearly people who are already following Jesus, but there is still a need for forgiveness. There's still an acknowledgement of sin that they have. Uh, in 1 John 1, 9, we looked at this verse two weeks ago, but I want to remind us of it today. Uh, John writes, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what we see here going on, first of all, is we confess sin. So obviously we have, there's an if here, so we have the option of doing this or not doing this, but clearly John is trying to lead us toward the doing this. So if we confess, there are things that are going to happen. First of all, he is faithful and just. His faithfulness and justice brings us forgiveness. So he's going to forgive sins based on the fact that we're confessing them, and then he is going to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So clearly, this praying for confession of sin is something that we definitely want to do because these things that we see receiving here in 1 John 1, 9, they're, they're all things that we want, aren't they? We, we want to be cleansed. We want to be new. We want to be different than we were before when we were stuck in sin. So let's look, let's look at some examples from Scripture here. Uh, first of all, in Psalm chapter 51, now, Psalm 51, uh, sometimes we don't know who writes the psalm, sometimes we do. Sometimes we don't know the occasion of it, sometimes we do. Uh, here in most Bibles, you have spelled out what this is about. This is a psalm of David, and it comes on the occasion of the fact that he has sinned with Bathsheba. And this is what he is feeling. So you have this large sin, uh, something that he is very convicted of, and this is how he feels toward God in the midst of that. In Psalm 51, beginning in verse 1, it says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my 
transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. So you, you've got David here in the midst of this unbelievable sin, uh, this sin that he has so rationalized his way through. And, and isn't this kind of the way that sin tends to work? We, we decide, well, you know, God, God really wants me to be happy. God really wants me to have whatever it is that I can have in life. And so I'm just going to go out there and take that thing. And then we don't realize all of the consequences that come with it. And oftentimes, it takes somebody like a Nathan the prophet to kind of get in our face, uh, oftentimes through a story about somebody else, because we, we can see it in somebody else's life before we can see it in our own. And then in the midst of all that, David is convicted and just feels broken. And then he calls out to God. Uh, or in a New Testament sense, we may look at this story, the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. This is a parable that Jesus tells, uh, but I would imagine it's the kind of situation that may unfold frequently in his day uh, and maybe also in our day. In Luke 18, verse 9, uh, he says, he told this story of a parable, uh, he told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Wow, what, what a description. You know, we, we talked this morning about we wouldn't want to be described as enemies of God as we were looking in Philippians chapter 3. I, I think this is another description we would definitely not want as followers of God. Uh, they are righteous and treated others with contempt. So he tells this story. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now, I want you to pause here for just a minute, because I know we, we are probably not fond of tax collectors nowadays. If you're visiting and you're a tax collector, I'm sorry, uh, you probably know that generally people struggle with you uh, because of what you do. Now, at the same time, what you're doing if you're a tax collector nowadays is it's a job that the government has. It's a little different than what was going on in Bible days. Now, in Bible days, you had these tax collectors that usually were of the same uh, nation in which they lived, and so it seemed like they were working for the outsiders because they were under Roman rule. And then in addition to that, they realized because of this position, they could get more money than they were owed. And so tax collector was just kind of synonymous with criminal. Tax collector was kind of synony synonymous with a, a turncoat, with somebody that just did not have the values of anybody you would want to know. And so at the beginning, you have this, and you have a Pharisee. Now, like I said, we're probably not still terribly fond of tax collectors nowadays. Nowadays, Pharisee takes on a different meaning than it did then. And it's hard for us to remember back to this point. Nowadays, we look at Pharisees as people that are overly legalistic, people that are so caught up on the rule, they miss the spirit of it, people who think they know everything, but they're always the foil of the story with Jesus. But in this day and time, they're pretty respected people. And even maybe those who would be annoyed by them kind of respected the things that they knew. And so if Jesus begins this story by saying there, are a, there is here a Pharisee and there is a tax collector, you probably immediately in your mind have already gone to who the good guy is and who the bad guy is as you hear the story. Uh, it is, and I don't know what it is for you, if I were to tell you the story of a, a Democrat and a Republican went in to pray, uh, there are all of you who immediately know which one is the good guy and which one is the bad guy. Uh, a sooner and a cowboy went in to pray. Which one is the good guy? We could do it any number of ways. But for them, it's going to turn on its head here in just a second in a way they do not see coming. So it says the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twi twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. Could you imagine, by the way, if Garrett had gotten up here to lead the prayer at the beginning? He said, God, the... Thank you for bringing us all together here to worship you. Thank you that I am not like all these people sitting in the pews. All the mess they have going on in their lives. And, and maybe even start pointing out some of, uh, you know, so-and-so who's got this going on. And thank you that I'm not like these people. Now, we, we don't think this way. Now, what's funny is I think the world around us honestly does think this is what we do. They, they think that we look at the world around us and we say, thank you, God, for not making me like that. And maybe we feel that way at times. I don't know. But here with the Pharisee and the tax collector, you have the Pharisee that it's all about where he is at above and where the tax collector is at below. And then it says, but the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, the one who humbles himself will be exalted. 
I was reading in a, a devotional book yesterday uh, about this story, and it struck me because I, I turned to this page in my devotional book, and there at the top it talked about prayer, and I thought, oh, timely, this is good. What is shocking about this prayer is that it's not a prayer at all. There's nothing prayer-like about what this man is doing. He's talking about the Pharisee. What he says is not prayer-like in posture, attitude, or content. In shocking self-confidence, he essentially looks God in the face and says, I don't need you. I don't need your compassion. I don't need your forgiveness. I don't need your strengthening. I don't need your wisdom. I don't need your help. I'm doing quite well on my own. We would never say these things, would we? I, I, I know that when we teach kids to pray, we, we don't suggest these kinds of lines, do we? And when we sit down to pray on our own, even if we struggle with what to say or where to begin, we don't tell God how much we don't need him. But how often through the things we do, the way in which we live, the way in which we act, do we live out this message completely unintentionally probably, but still live in such a way that says this, God, I can handle this. I got this on my own. When we use prayer as last resort, by the way, this is what we are doing. We are telling God, I got this, I can handle it, don't worry about me, it's all good, and then we keep doing what we're doing. And then what the Pharisee in this story adds to it is this comparison between where he is at with this and where somebody else is at with this. So the Pharisee basically says, look at me. Look at how great I'm doing, God. I'm doing all these things you've told me to do. All these things are going well, and just look at me. And what the, Pharisee, or what the tax collector is saying, I, I can't even look at you. He's described as off at a distance, doesn't even want to lift up his head to look. He's in complete humility where the other just doesn't even see what's going on. The difference is how they see themselves. And, and maybe this is part of where our struggle in the prayer of confession might come in, is how do we see ourselves? Now, I don't want you to leave here complete, feeling completely down on yourself. That's not the point of this. But at the same time, I do want us all to leave here feeling realistic about ourselves. Uh, we read in James, when we were studying James uh, a few months back now, uh, about the one that looks in the mirror and, and looks away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Sometimes when it comes to our spiritual walk, this is how we see ourselves. And we forget because we want to either not think of how bad some of the things we do are, or we think in terms of, well, at least I'm not as bad as this. This is why in our culture we tend to single out some sins above others. Because it's easy for us to point to those and say, well, at least I don't do that. At least I don't have that problem. And most of us at some point are guilty of this at least a little bit. There, there's someone out there that has a sin that's one that doesn't tempt you remotely. And you don't understand how in the world they can find themselves in it. And you think to yourself, well, at least I don't, I don't do that. At least I'm not there. And so there's this difference in how they see themselves. And the big difference, I think, here is one of them sees the need for forgiveness and the other one doesn't. And maybe sometimes that's where we are. We, we, we have convinced ourselves, you know, I, I got forgiveness way back when, when I was baptized and changed my life. And sure, I probably slip up here and there, but I, do I need forgiveness at the level that really requires the, the C out of the acts here of prayer or can I just move on to the other stuff? So the question for us is, do we need forgiveness? Uh, spoiler alert, yes, uh, we do. But let me give you a little context on that. Where we read in 1 John 1, 9, I want to give you the verses on either side of that here. 1 John 1, 8 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And again, I don't think we would say we have no sin out loud. We understand that Jesus is the sinless one and the rest of us just kind of do the best we can and slip up here and there. But sometimes we, we, in our prayer, almost come across this way if we're not cautious. And then the verse that we read, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. And then the verse that follows, if we say we have not sinned, he already said basically this in verse 8, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So do we need forgiveness we do. Clearly we do. So if you believe me, uh, or if you don't believe me, believe John, because he wrote it down long before I thought of it, we do need forgiveness, so what do we do about it? I if we acknowledge there is this thing that I need when it comes to my relationship with God, then what do we do? And, and believe me, as Church of Christ folks, th this should hit home for us, because we are all about this kind of thing. What do I need to do to be saved? Uh, if you go out to the track racks on either side out here, there, there's a track on both sides. What must I do to be saved? And it will tell you the whole plan of salvation and all those things. Here's a what must I do for forgiveness. And it is spelled out very well 
for us in Scripture, once we have followed him, once we have been baptized and find ourselves falling back into that sin again, because that's who John writes to in 1 John 1. It's Christians. It's people who are struggling with the same things that we, we struggle with. What do we do? James gives us the, the short answer, which is this. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So first of all, we confess our sins. We acknowledge the fact, and maybe there's a, a, just a given kind of step with confessing your sins, is an acknowledgement that you have them. So because we know we have sin, we're going to confess sin. And then secondly, we're going to pray. So we're going to pray to God about the sin that's in our lives, and we want, con- we want to confess that, and we want for that to be made better. And then there's this other little piece of it. It's, it's the one another's. Before and after this prayer, you have a one another squeezed in here, which is to say, this is not just me and God. That, that is very important to it. It's very much an essential piece of it. But there's a larger piece of it than that. It is the reason why that we confess to one another. It's so we can hold each other a little more accountable. Uh, have you had times where you've struggled with sin in life and you've had trouble kicking that? And then someone who is close to you, you confess to them the struggle that you're having how much easier it is, is it to try to work through that when someone can hold you accountable? When c- someone can say, you know, I know you're struggling with, and since you're struggling with, h- how are you doing with that? How can I help? Wh- what steps are you taking? Wh- what's going on in your life? So there's a one another piece. And then that we may be healed. So this confession can actually change things. It can make us go from a place where we are not okay to a place where we are. And then there is great power as this prayer and as God himself is working in us. So if we do all of these things, we can become more of who God has called us to be once again. So what does a prayer of confession look like? Again, this is not something that we center in on all the time. Uh, We don't think of confession just frequently, I imagine. We talk about all kinds of other things in the Christian walk, but what does a prayer of of confession look like? And I think, again, we can go back to Psalm 51 and David. We get a little bit of his heart in the first part of the psalm. As we move down a few verses, we see a little more of his interaction from God, with God and what he's asking for. So in verse 9, he says, Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. So first of all, he says to God, I, I need to be forgiven. So I want you to not look on my sin, and I want you to blot it out. I, I love the imagery there of the, the blotting out. Uh, There was a thing, everybody under about 35 maybe in here, uh, there was a thing called a typewriter a long time ago, uh, and there's actually one in one of the church office closets, by the way. Uh, I was shocked to find out the other day. Uh, There was this thing called a typewriter, and uh, you didn't have the thing where you would just backspace and delete like you do on your computer. You had a thing where you would backspace and get to the same spot, and then you had something called liquid paper. And liquid paper was basically like white fingernail polish. And you would go and you would put liquid paper on top of the mistake you had made and then you would type over it again after it had dried. You have to wait and be patient. And you would just hope that you would not make another typo anytime soon because you have to repeat the process all over again and go back and liquid paper again and do all those things. You always notice, though. I I remember taking typing as a freshman in high school and our typing teacher was trying to show us how to do the liquid paper so it's really hard to notice but it's still noticeable. Uh, Now, most of the guys in that class, like me, it was just a big glob uh, of white there on the page, and it was very clear. Nowadays, you've got backspace and and delete and all that stuff, and you never know there was ever a typo there in the first place. You just fix it. He says to God, I want my sin blotted out. I don't think he's looking for the liquid paper version. I, I think he's saying to God, I want you to make this as if it never was. Now, he understands at the same time there are consequences that come with sin. Because when we sin and it affects other people and other people, and you can clearly see in David's life, there are consequences that come, but still he says to God, when it comes to my relationship with you, I want you to blot out my sin. Then in verse 10 he says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So next he wants renewal. He, He wants to have a spirit that is new. He wants to have a heart that is new. He wants to be able to get up the next day and to live in such a way that this is not constantly over him. Now, for those of us who have sinned, especially those who have sinned in large ways, you know there's a piece of it that always seems to be there. But he says to God, help me be new. And I I believe these are the same things that are in our prayers of confession. God, I, I want you to get rid of the sin that's there. And then secondly, God, 
I want you to make me new. I, I want you to give me another opportunity to start over. Then he continues, cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. The third thing I need from you, God, is I want, I want to draw near to you. I want you to draw near to me. And this is where sometimes as Christians we, we fall off of this because we get embarrassed or we don't want, maybe, maybe we're a little bit like the tax collector in that story of we, we want to kind of stay at a distance and we don't want to look people in the eye. And David recognizes, you know, I understand the spirit that is behind all of that, but what we really need here is to draw close to God. All those one another that we looked at in James 5, you can't have those if you're not around one another, can you? It's hard to have the pray for one another and forgive one another and all of those things if we are not one anothering, if we're not here together. And so he says, draw near. The time where we need to not run from God is not when we are struggling with all these things and in need of forgiveness. Those are the times we need to draw closer to him. Then he continues in verse 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold, with, uh, uphold me with a willing spirit. And then he says, God, I need restoration. Restore me. And I love the imagery of this. The, the, make me new. I've mentioned to you before, uh, I love old Corvettes. Uh, I probably never in my life have an old Corvette. That's one of those unrealized dreams I probably should have mentioned in the car yesterday. I'll probably never have an old Corvette. The restored ones are really cool uh, because they look like the day they were driven out of the showroom. They're just perfect. But the restored ones cost a lot of money. And then you can find one that still costs way too much, but it's because it is yet to be restored. And it's interesting to me, everything that goes into restoring one of those cars to make it look like it once did. Uh, my uncle, when I was growing up, had a 1971 Corvette. Uh, he drove it, uh, he actually, it was shipped while he was in Vietnam, piloting helicopters. My grandfather got to drive it around for a little while because it showed up before my uncle got back from Vietnam. And then my uncle drove it from uh, 71 to 83, doing all the work on it himself. Anything that ever was done to that car, he did it. He completely rebuilt the engine, he repainted it, did all kinds of stuff. Somewhere along the way, he finally started having other people do things to it. And then he hit a point where he thought, it's time to restore it. And he took it to a guy in Dallas and said, what would it cost to do this? And, and the number was a very large number that it would cost to restore it. And he learned in the midst of that, that if you were to go to the underside of the 1971 Corvette, there are three different shades of black paint on the underside of the 1971 Corvette. Now, if I were to restore it, there would probably be one shade of black paint under there. Because I don't care. Nobody's ever going to see it. It's just going to be me. I'll know. It'll probably bother me a little bit. But the trouble it would take to tape all that stuff off in the right way and just have this one shade of black paint here and another shade here and another shade here. When David says to God, restore me, God has a power to do this in a way that's beyond what we can imagine. If you have found yourself in the depths of sin that you just think to yourself, this can never be fixed. This can never look like it used to look. God would say, well, just hang on and watch, because this is what I do. And David knows that about God. He knows the consequences, but at the same time, he knows God is the one who can make me new, who can restore me, who can change me. And so a part of our prayer of confession is, God, make me like I used to be. Make me like you had me at the beginning. Give me that feeling I had when I came up out of the water the first time. Then he continues in verse 13, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. And there's another element here that we probably don't think about an awful lot to teach. And part of this is God teaching us that he renews and restores and changes and gets rid of that sin. But part of it is as others around watch, that's why the one another piece of this is so important by the way, as others see this restoring taking place, they begin to recognize God really can do this. Whatever the sin is that I'm struggling with, that I'm embarrassed by, that I stay at a distance, that I don't want to look people in the eye about, God can change this too. And so when I come with this prayer, when David comes with this prayer in Psalm 51, he knows that not only is this something that's for me, but there will be people who learn from this. I think David ever imagined that 2,000 years after the New Testament is written, which means several hundred years after all of his stuff happens, that there will still be people talking about, number one, his sin with Bathsheba, which he's probably not thrilled to know about that. But number two, that they are learning from the way he is still forgiven in the midst of that, the way he still is able to restore his life to become a man after God's own heart. 
all these years later, we are still learning from David. Do you not think that as we are forgiven, as we confess, as we are restored, that those around us cannot learn from us and that we cannot look at each other and learn from each other? Or we could also look at this from a New Testament point of view. Parable of the lost son, or the prodigal son, depending on your version of Scripture. This is very familiar to most of you if you've been around church. If you have not been around church or you're watching online, it's new to you. Basically, the story is this. There's a guy that uh, is raised in a wealthy household. He has, has the audacity one day, walk into dad and say, I'd like my inheritance now. I, I want to go out and live life. I don't want to wait until you're gone, old man. I want the inheritance and I want it now. And his dad, rather than laughing, which would be my reaction at that point, <laughs> first of all, I'd be like, what inheritance? Uh, and then second, I'd be, no, we're not going to do that now. His dad gives it to him. And he does exactly what all of the I told you so's among us would assume he would do. He goes out and he blows it all. And he blows it on, as the King James put, puts it, riotous living. He is just living life out there to the point that once it's all gone and he's wasted it all, he finds himself feeding pigs, uh, which if you're a Jewish person of that day and time is about as unclean as it gets. Not just the wealth and the dirtiness of the pigs, but even spiritually they are unclean. And he is not just feeding the pigs, but at one point he is so hungry that he looks at what the pigs are eating and he thinks to himself, that looks all right. That's a bad point to be at. And in the midst of all that, he begins to realize, you know, if I just worked for my dad at this point, I would be in so much a better spot than I am. So midway through the chapter, uh, it says that he's planning this. In verse 18, it says, I'll arise, I'll go to my father, I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And as I've told you when we've studied this story, uh, I've often imagined him making that long trudging walk home, rehearsing this in his mind. Exactly what he's going to say, how he's going to say it. Uh, if the response is not what he's hoping for, maybe what the response will be to that. Probably going through all that, looking at his feet as he goes along. May maybe questioning if he should go somewhere along the way. And this is what he's going to say. So when he shows up at home, what is the father's response, or as the parable would tell us, what's God's response when, when someone has so messed up, so completely messed up life, that all they can do is come back kind of groveling? What's God's response to that? It says in verse 20 that as he's coming in the distance, it says, he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Then you have time to hear the story. He tries to get the story out. He tries to, to go with the rehearsed lines. Dad doesn't even want to hear it. It's not important. Verse 22 says, The father said to his servants, as the son's trying to talk, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. When you come to God with your confession of sin, it's not just renewal and restoration and blocking out and all of those things. It is celebration. He is so, so happy to have you back from wherever you have been. That thing in your mind that has convinced you you've gone too far, that thing in your mind that has convinced you that he, he doesn't want me anymore, he's not going to understand this, there's none of that with God. There is a celebration that comes with God. There's forgiveness and there's celebration. But what is our response? I have always wished, uh, just a little bit, that that parable would have ended with that verse. That's a pretty good ending to the story. But we know, for those of us who've been around church for a while and have heard this story, we know it doesn't end there. It says that there's an older son out there, and as the celebration's going on, in verse 28, he's described as angry. He is angry and he refuses to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you, I've never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. Sometimes the reaction is anger and bitterness, isn't it? I hate this when I read it in the older brother because I've seen it too many times. There have been those times where someone just desperately wants to make their life right. And there's a lot of folks that are around with the, I told you so. There's a lot of folks that are around with the, 
well, you're going to have to do this and this and this and this. And what we see in God, celebration, forgiveness. What are we going to do? What, what is our reaction going to be when there is the confession? Because we, we teach this over and over again. We, we, we have been taught from day one, you can fall away from grace. We have these arguments with other, other denominations about that, about what's saved, always saved. And we point to verses and talk about how you've got examples here where clearly there is someone who was saved and now, and now there's a, a loss of that salvation. You've got to be cautious about that. And what do you do? And we've always come back to you pray for forgiveness. You confess your sins. This is what you do. So what if they actually do it? And what if it rises to the level of they're not just going to confess it to God and be between me and God, but there's going to be, as James 5 tells us, this one another piece of it. How are we, as brothers and sisters, going to react? And what we find in the older brother here is the what not to do. And what we find in the father is what he wants of us. What is God's response to that? What's God's response when the older brother's angry, when the other brother tells about, well, here's everything you've not done for me, and why are you doing these things for him? How does God respond? He said to him, son, you're always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. He wants them both. He wants both brothers in his family. There's a part of me, every time I read Luke 15, I just want to smack the older brother in Christian love. Just want to shake him a little bit. And, and take him back to, to 1 John 1. Are you going to stand here and tell me you're without sin? That's what I want to say to him. Because you may have been here, you may have been working hard, but how many days have you woken up with that anger towards your younger brother who's out there living life? How many days are you a little bit jealous because you wonder what he's up to out there while you're out here just working and working and working? How many days do you feel unappreciated? How many days does sin come into our lives and someone confesses and we, we're back there with the Pharisee and the tax collector, aren't we? Thank you, God, that I'm not like them. Thank you, God, that I don't struggle with that sin. While all the while we know there is a sin within us that we desperately want to make sure nobody ever finds out about. And the beauty of this story is God wants us both. He wants those of us who are struggling to hide it, who are frustrated with the ones who confess it because it's not the same sin that we have, and those who are just desperately trying to make things right. He wants all of us to be part of his family. And that is a glorious message. That is the reason why our confession is so important because there is nowhere we need to be rather than with God. So tonight, I think we have probably found ourselves in one point or another in this story in life. We have at times been that Pharisee, where we have just felt like, you know, even if I don't have it fully together, I sure have it more together than other people do. Or sometimes we have been like that young son before he begins the journey, and we have thought to ourselves, I know better than everybody else. I know better than mom and dad. I know better than my church family. I know better than my preacher, my Bible class teacher. I know the right thing, way to do these things. I'm going to go out and do it. And some people come to it quickly, or for some people, it's that moment where they're looking at the pig food and it looks good. And they come back and just want to make it right. And I will tell you, for some people, if they have those struggles and they come back and they confess and they want to make it right, there is an embrace that is the celebration that the Father shows. And unfortunately in church, for too many people, it's the other. It's the older brother not standing at the distance like the tax collector in the story because he's humble and understands his place in it, but standing in the distance, he's not ready to forgive yet. And he's just out there angry with his arms crossed, saying, not yet. You, you got to do a whole lot more before you get forgiveness from me. And unfortunately, where, where do we begin all this? Back in Luke 11. Forgive us, God, as we forgive. Do we really want that? I mean, Jesus said, this is how you pray. Forgive us as we forgive. And I will tell you, if that is the way we want God to forgive us, we better be doing a whole lot of forgiving. And be really free with it. And not have a lot of strings attached to it. And just hope for the best. And wish for the best. And try to bring one another along for the best. Wherever you find yourself in the story tonight, God wants you in his family. He wants you to be part of all of this. He wants you, if it is a sin that is in your life that needs to be confessed, he wants you to do that. And I don't know what the context is for that for you. Uh, obviously, there is a piece of this that's you and God. 
But for a lot of those sins, either because others are involved, there needs to be confession for that, or maybe sometimes because we desperately need someone to hold us accountable, there needs to be confession in that way. And let me encourage you to do that tonight. If it's coming up here, if it's going to the room back there with one of our elders to do that, you can do that. If you have never followed him, because you've assumed, well, all those people are just like that Pharisee in the story anyway, they're just like the older brother, N- not all of them. Maybe too many of them, but not all of them. And we're trying desperately to do this in the right way and would love to walk alongside you as we do it. If you need to follow him tonight for the first time, if you need to come back to him, or if you need to just be reminded tonight not to be the older brother, not to be the Pharisee in the story, but to be the one that offers forgiveness in the same way that you want it, please come while we stand in